What are gotcha questions? We all have seen them when someone asks another person a question that's designed to make them feel stupid or to trap them in a position that is completely untenable or ridiculous. Well, we have these gotcha questions when it comes to Catholicism all the time. And they're the questions that people ask that they think Catholics have no answer for or that they will expose the error of their belief. And there are many. For example, where is that in the Bible? Didn't God say, don't make idols? Or why did the Catholic Church change the Ten Commandments? There are so many, but for this first video in this series, I want to start with perhaps the most popular one. Are Catholics saved? Does the Catholic Church even understand the gospel? You'd be amazed at how many Protestants out there think that it doesn't. When I was a Protestant, I thought I knew everything about the gospel. Not in the sense of the nuances and all the deep theological truths, but in the simple sense of the clear truth of what it means to be justified, to be saved. That's the basics, right? And yet, it was amazing to me how when I would talk to Catholics, they had seemingly no understanding of this. We've all seen those awful videos with Ray Comfort where he finds the most out-to-lunch college students and he asks them all these questions. And then he says, how can we sinners deserving of hell be justified in the sight of a holy, righteous, perfect God? And then he asks them, are you a Christian? And they almost always answer, well, I'm Catholic, and there you go. So when I met this Catholic man named Devin and asked him the gotcha question, are you saved? I was shocked when he shared with me a different answer, an answer that certainly included my understanding of the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross, but also included things I hadn't completely unpacked, like baptism and the relationship between grace, faith, and obedience. That conversation changed my life, and as you have probably figured out, eventually, I became a Catholic. Never in a million years would I have thought that would happen, but here I am, and I am more passionate about the gospel than ever. My relationship with Jesus is deeper than I have ever experienced, and my life as a disciple has been transformed in so many ways by God's grace. Not long ago, a non-Catholic friend on the channel asked me to make a video defining what the Catholic Church teaches about salvation. I had honestly never thought to make a video about that before because I didn't think it was necessary. I mean, isn't it obvious? But judging by the number of comments I get telling me that Catholics worship Mary and believe that we teach a works-based salvation or a false gospel, apparently it isn't as obvious as I'd hoped. So let's do this. Like anything else, if you want to know what the Catholic Church teaches, the best place to go is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism is a summary of the teachings of the Catholic Church, but don't let the word summary fool you into thinking it's not rich, deep, and filled with beauty in Scripture. You might not agree, but at the very least, if you want to make any sort of claim about what Catholicism is or isn't, the Catechism is the best place to start. So what does the Catechism say about salvation? Well, it says a lot, and my goal here is not to explain everything the Catechism says, but to focus on the key points of salvation and what I think are the motivations when Protestants ask this question. But in order to even set the stage, let me set the context. The Declaration of Faith found in the Church's most cherished creed lays out the basic beliefs of Catholicism. And at the risk of overlooking something obvious, like the belief in a triune God while at the same time affirming monotheism, I will begin by reading the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, how awesome is that? The basic creed that lays out Christianity for us, but unfortunately, in today's post-Reformation world where there are so many people who have so many different views, oftentimes just stating the creed itself isn't going to get the job done when it comes to answering this question. We can say for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, but people say, well, what does that mean? So what I want to do today is unpack salvation a little bit more. And I have six things about the Catholic view of salvation that I'd like to share. And it first begins with this understanding that all human beings, with a couple of exceptions, are born in a state of original sin and without the intervention of God will spend eternity separated from God. The Catholic Church teaches that mankind was created by God. The first humans, Adam and Eve, sinned by disobeying God in the Garden of Eden. It was at this point sin entered the world. We refer to this as original sin, which is distinguished from actual sin. Original sin is inherited. Original sin sets us at odds with God even at the moment of our conception. Actual sin is the sin we commit personally. Original sin leads us to actual sin and both separate us from God. This is all laid out in the first part of the catechism in paragraphs 396 through 409. And I'm going to read a couple of them for you right now. The first one is paragraph 402 from the catechism, and here's what it says. All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms, by one man's disobedience, many, that is, all men, were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. The apostle contrasts the universality of sin and death with the universality of salvation in Christ. Then, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. I'm laying this out because it's important to understand the church's view on original sin because it relates to the church's teaching on grace and baptism, which are linked to salvation. You can't solve a problem that doesn't exist, and salvation is an answer to a problem. Jesus reminds us in John 3, 16 through 18, that the world is already condemned. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. In short, Without God, we are already condemned because we have the stain of original sin on us from our conception. And as we commit actual sin, our guilt is made even more evident. But God had a plan. And as the catechism says in paragraph 410, after his fall, man was not abandoned by God. On the contrary, God calls him and in a mysterious way heralds the coming victory over evil and his restoration from his fall. This passage in Genesis is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, the first announcement of the Messiah and Redeemer of a battle between the serpent and the woman and of the final victory of a descendant of hers. Even back in Genesis, God was announcing his plan. So point number two is this. God sent his son Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, into the world to save the world through his sacrificial death on the cross and literal bodily resurrection. God's plan was to come to earth in the person of Jesus for our salvation. But what does this mean? How does Jesus coming to earth accomplish this? The key phrase in the creed that we read earlier is for our sake, he was crucified. The Catholic church teaches that Christ's death on the cross was a sacrifice made on our behalf. And through his sacrifice, our sins were covered by his blood. There is a strong connection in Catholicism between the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the Passover lamb from Exodus. Not that there isn't in other forms of Christianity, but in Catholicism, it's completely central. This understanding relates to the issue of salvation because the church recognizes that slavery to sin is overcome not by our own efforts, but by the blood of Jesus, who like the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Its blood applied to the households of the people of God, and it was eaten by his people. This, of course, also relates to the Eucharist, but that's for another video. 
If you want to read about this in the catechism, head over to paragraph 599 and start there. But I'm going to read a few paragraphs starting at 604 and bouncing around just a little bit. By giving up his own son for our sins, God manifests that his plan for us is one of benevolent love prior to any merit on our part. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The son of God who came down from heaven, not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him, said on coming into the world, lo, I have come to do your will, O God. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. From the first moment of his incarnation, the son embraces the father's plan of divine salvation in his redemptive mission. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. The sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the whole world expresses his loving communion with the father. The father loves me because I lay down my life, said the Lord, for I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. Paragraph 608 reads, after agreeing to baptize him along with the sinners, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and pointed him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By doing so, he reveals that Jesus is at the same time the suffering servant who silently allows himself to be led to the slaughter and who bears the sin of the multitudes and also the Paschal Lamb, the symbol of Israel's redemption at the first Passover. Christ's whole life expresses his mission to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus freely embraced the Father's redeeming love. Paragraph 613. Christ's death is both the paschal sacrifice that accomplishes the definitive redemption of man through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the sacrifice of the new covenant, which restores man to communion with God by reconciling him to God through the blood of the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This sacrifice of Christ is unique it completes and surpasses all other sacrifices. First, it is a gift from God, the Father himself. For the Father handed his Son over to sinners in order to reconcile us with himself. At the same time, it is the offering of the Son of God made man, who in freedom and love offered his life to his Father through the Holy Spirit in reparation for our disobedience. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By his obedience unto death, Jesus accomplished the substitution of the suffering servant who makes himself an offering for sin when he bore the sin of many and who shall make many to be accounted righteous for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus atoned for our faults and made satisfaction for our sins to the father. That's a lot, isn't it? And you might think, Keith, why did you read so much from the catechism? Well, here's the deal. So much of what I just read, I think is going to shock a lot of people who think the Catholic Church is all about earning your way to heaven and, and, and meriting salvation for yourself and seems to downplay what Christ did on the cross. Friends, I want you to really think about that. If you need to go back and listen to it again, do it. Or read those paragraphs from the catechism yourself and then tell me where you disagree with that if you're a Protestant. Point number three, God offers salvation to all through his grace. Human beings cannot earn salvation or merit it on their own. Grace is an undeserved gift given by God and is the means by which anyone can receive salvation. Now, some of you probably went, wait a second. Are you doing a bait and switch here, Keith? I thought you were talking about Catholicism, but what you just laid out sounds a lot like Reformed theology, the doctrines of grace and all this stuff. I mean, Keith, come on. What are you trying to do to us? Hey, friends. I'm just telling you what the catechism says. Look at paragraph 1996 and tell me if you don't think this is the gospel. Our justification comes from the grace of God. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. Boom. Did you hear that? Does that sound like what you thought Catholicism taught? about salvation? My guess is that it doesn't. All right, moving on. Point number four, human beings must respond to God's grace through faith in Christ and obedience to his commands 
as they are able. And the Catechism tells us that faith itself is a grace. Paragraph 153 says this, when St. Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus declared to him that this revelation did not come from flesh and blood, but from my Father who is in heaven. Faith is a gift of God, a supernatural virtue infused by him. Before this faith can be exercised, man must have the grace of God to move and assist him. He must have the interior helps of the Holy Spirit who moves the heart and converts it to God, who opens the eyes of the mind and makes it easy for all to accept and believe the truth. Did you hear that? Some of you are going, wait a minute. Wasn't that like something R.C. Sproul said? No, my friends, this is the catechism of the Catholic Church. Let's continue. Paragraph 154. Believing is possible only by grace and the interior helps of the Holy Spirit, but it is no less true that believing is an authentically human act. Trusting in God and cleaving to the truths he has revealed is contrary neither to human freedom nor to human reason. Even in our human relations, it is not contrary to our dignity to believe what other persons tell us about themselves and their intentions or to trust their promises. For example, when a man and woman marry to share a communion of life with one another, if this is so, Still less is it contrary to our dignity to yield by faith the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals and to share in an interior communion with him. In faith, the human intellect and will cooperate with divine grace. Believing is an act of the intellect, assenting to the divine truth by command of the will moved by God through grace. Pretty powerful stuff there, my friends. Do you earn your way to salvation? Do you figure it out on your own? No, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's all God's grace. But we have to respond to that. But even that response, my friends, is an act of grace from God. But we do have to respond. And I know this is where some people get completely wigged out. But listen to what paragraph 2013 says. All Christians in any state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. All are called to holiness. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In order to reach this perfection, the faithful should use the strength dealt out to them by Christ's gift, so that, doing the will of the Father in everything, they may wholeheartedly devote themselves to the glory of God and to the service of their neighbor. Thus, the holiness of the people of God will grow in fruitful abundance, as is clearly shown in the history of the church through the lives of so many saints. So in essence, the catechism is teaching, as the scripture does, that we must make a response, but yet that response comes by the grace of God, but yet we fully participate in it because we're not robots. Our intellect and our will are given to us by God, and God designed us that we can give full assent to him. It's an act of God, but it's also an act of our humanity, and we're called to do that. Point number five. When a person has received the grace of God through baptism, they are forgiven, justified, and sanctified, and are in a state of grace. In other words, they're saved. Again, this is the work of God who invites us into a personal relationship with him. But this relationship involves cooperation on our part. But as we've said before, that cooperation itself is the result of grace. Paragraph 2001 says, the preparation of man for the reception of grace is already a work of grace. This latter is needed to arouse and sustain our collaboration in justification through faith and in sanctification through charity. God brings to completion in us what he has begun, since he who completes his work by cooperating with our will began by working so that we might will it. Number six. A person remains in a state of grace unless they commit a mortal sin. A person can be reconciled back to Jesus through the sacrament of confession, which absolves them from their sins and restores them to salvation. Now we're getting into a little bit about what happens post-justification, post-salvation, but I wanted to include this because it's, it's a part of it. In paragraph 1854, we're going to read about what the Catechism says about sins. It says this, Sins are rightly evaluated according to their gravity. The distinction between mortal and venial sin, already evident in Scripture, became part of the tradition of the church. 
It is corroborated by human experience. In paragraph 1855, we read, Mortal sin destroys charity in the heart of man by a grave violation of God's law. It turns man away from God, who is his ultimate end and his beatitude, by preferring an inferior good to him. Venial sin allows charity to subsist even though it offends and wounds it. Paragraph 1856. Mortal sin, by attacking the vital principle within us, that is charity, necessitates a new initiative of God's mercy and a conversion of heart, which is normally accomplished within the setting of the sacrament of reconciliation. And I'd like to share some of the scripture that informs the church's view of this. First of all, in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, St. Paul's speaking to believers in the church, and he says this in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, remember, friends, he's warning the people who are already part of the church. He's warning them of these grave sins, and if they enter into these sins, that they will not enter the kingdom of God. Another example of this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, where St. Paul is continuing to warn the believers there, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now, some people stop right there and they go, yeah, he's talking about what they were and now they're justified. Well, yeah, and he's warning them not to do these things. So it doesn't make any sense to say, well, that's talking about people out in the world. He's not talking to them. He's talking to the church. Apostle also warns the church in Ephesians 5 that their behavior could disqualify them from the kingdom of God. And of course, in 1 John 5, verses 16 through 17, we read about this mortal sin. He writes, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. So again, we see the distinction, some that leads to death and some that does not. How do you make sense of this if we all say, well, every sin is exactly the same? Friends, it's not what the Bible teaches. So if you've committed that mortal sin, if you've fallen away, if you've given yourself willingly and you've turned your back on Christ, what then? How are we to be brought back? Well, this is where the church's teaching about the sacrament of reconciliation comes into play. That's right. I'm talking about confession. The catechism talks about a lot of these things in great detail, starting in paragraph 1422. But here are a couple of quotes that hopefully will help you understand. Let's talk first about confession to a priest. In paragraph 1446, we read this. Christ instituted the sacrament of penance for all sinful members of his church. Above all for those who, since baptism, have fallen into grave sin and have thus lost their baptismal grace and wounded ecclesial communion. It is to them that the sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and to recover the grace of justification. The fathers of the church present this sacrament as the second plank of salvation after the shipwreck, which is the loss of grace. Paragraph 1441 says, Only God forgives sins. Since he is the son of God, Jesus says of himself, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins and exercises this divine power. Your sins are forgiven. Further, by virtue of his divine authority, he gives this power to men to exercise in his name. Now, people want to argue about what was going on in John 20, 23, where Jesus gives this authority to his apostles. But I'm just trying to show you where this belief comes from in the catechism. And I really think if you read those texts, you'll understand why it makes so much sense to believe what the church believes about this, that Jesus gave this authority to his apostles because we are going to need it. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain are retained. Pretty powerful stuff. Now, people ask the question then, well then, so how can you know 
that you're saved. I mean, if you've got all these different crazy things and how do you know about all this stuff and, and can't you have any assurance of salvation? Well, the truth is you can, and I'm going to make another video about that soon. But for this video, I hope that some of your questions were answered. Now, this is, of course, by no means an exhaustive treatment of the subject and has probably and hopefully led to many more questions. And that's a good thing. And I want those of you who, like I used to be, think you know what the Catholic Church teaches about salvation to continue to ask questions. Dig in. Have conversations. Read the catechism for yourself. Learn. And even if you aren't convinced that Catholicism is the fullness of the Christian faith, you will, at the very least, be able to have more intelligent and productive conversations with Catholics about salvation than what I often see here on my YouTube channel. So, what did I miss? If you're a Catholic and you say, Keith, you didn't talk about this, you didn't talk about that, leave some more information in the comments. And what questions do those of you that were new to this have about this? Leave those in the comments too, but please be charitable. I want our channel to be a place where people can ask honest and real questions, but without all of the vitriol and the sarcastic comments and the gotcha questions. Now, I'll be back soon with the next installment of Gotcha Questions for Catholics, and I wonder if you'll be able to figure out what it's going to be next. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. Take care, and God bless.